good morning. I'm happy to see that my sermon is up here because I set it up here earlier and walked away and left it. Or you would get the abridged version this morning for sure. I want to talk to you about Psalm 23. And orange, you glad I didn't say Psalm 23. Okay, with the orange shirt, you know you're getting at least one. That's my one. But you know, Psalm 23 is probably the one of the most familiar Bible verses probably of all time. You know, it, it's the most quoted, that's for sure. We, we hear it all over the place. We hear it all the time. You know, there was a, a Sunday school class, and the teacher was trying to get the class to memorize Psalm 23. The big deal was they were going to have this big event where all the kids were going to come gather up to the front of the church uh, center here, and they were all going to take their turn and recite Psalm 23. And so the kids worked on it week after week, and the teacher worked with them the best that she could. But there was one kid, he just couldn't get it. He tried, and he tried, he just couldn't get it. Some of it would stick, but it wasn't all sticking. And so he would get to a certain point, and ah, he'd get frustrated. And he'd always go over, and he'd sit down, and he'd just kind of pout about it. He just couldn't get through a certain block. There was just a block at a certain, at a certain point. Well, the day finally came, and all the kids are gathered up front. And it's no different. This little guy, he's running through his head. He's trying to remember the best he can. There are a couple other students before him, which which is helpful, right? If you've ever been in that situation, you know just listen to those sticky parts of the kids next to you because they got it. He tried, but he, he was too scared, right? It's that fear of public speaking thing. I don't know what that is. It's kind of crazy, but he's standing there, and he gives him the microphone, and he takes it, and he looks at the congregation, and every single eye was staring at him, and you could hear a pin drop on the carpet. It was that quiet. They're all staring him down, and he's starting to get warm, and he's starting to sweat. And he looks at, the, looks at the people, and he says, The Lord is my shepherd, and that's all I need to know. And he hands the microphone to the next person in line. <laughs> you know, in many ways, that, that kid got it right. Seriously, the Lord is my shepherd, and that's really all we need to know for the most part. You know, I think we overanalyze biblical texts sometimes way too much. We, we want to look at something we want to go 10 miles deep when we don't have to because there's some great stuff right at the surface level. Psalm 23 is like that. There's some good stuff when you dig down deep, but there are some beautiful golden gems that are right on the very top of this psalm. And you know, it's one of the most loved of all, probably of all the psalms, but definitely of all the confidence psalms. What I mean by that is, is David is expressing his confidence in the Lord's provision, in the Lord's care. He's not asking God for anything. He's, it's not a prayer. He's just expressing this to God. You're so awesome. You're my shepherd. I don't want anything. And he goes through that. And he breaks that down, what that really looks like. And we're going to look at that in just a few moments as well. But, but it's very, very familiar to Dave. He, David. He understands it because he used to be a shepherd. In his young years, in his childhood, he was out tending the sheep. That was his job. He knew what it meant to be a shepherd. He understood in verses 5 and 6 where it talks about the Lord as this gracious host. He knew that. His adult life as king, he would play host to many people that would come and visit. It was very, very familiar for David. And now, now the, uh, the, the sandal is on the other foot, right? David is no longer the shepherd. Now he's the sheep. He's not the host. Now he's the guest And it's none other than the Lord God who is the shepherd and who is the host at this point. You know, these six verses and 118 words are very, very familiar. They've been spoken, they've been read, they've been recited for years and years to millions of people. They've been heard in more hospital rooms and funerals and grave sites than we could even possibly count. They've dried a multitude of tears because the words provide hope, strength, courage. They're familiar. We know it. I talked with Doug Seaman this morning and and he said, what are we doing? I said, Psalm 23. And he made a joke and he said, well, nobody's ever heard of that one. You know, but it's true. We know it. Most of you in here could probably quote Psalm 23 right now. You could pro- some of you could probably do it in multiple verses 
different translations, I mean, not verses, but different translations. Some of you, it's familiar, you've heard it, but you might not be able to get through it. You might start with, the Lord is my shepherd and that's all I need. That might be as far as you get. And that's okay. It's familiar. But listen, there, there are two sides to the familiar coin, okay? One is it's familiar, it's great, because it can sink in and it can stick with us. And even though we don't have it all memorized, we can walk away knowing, okay, the Lord is my shepherd, and that's important, and I need to remember that. So there's some familiarity. That's really good. But the, the downside to the familiar aspect is because it's familiar, as we talked about many, many weeks ago, those, there's certain texts in the Bible, they seem familiar. Because they're familiar, we don't give them much stock. We just kind of read them. You know, our eyes glaze over and we're like, oh, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me delight. And we just roll through it. And there's, there's nothing there because we're missing all the blessing that's in the text. We're missing everything that God has for us because it's familiar. So this morning, I want to reacquaint. Yes, you already know it. You're familiar with it. But I want to reacquaint you with Psalm 23 because we're going to dig a little bit But we're going to stay on the surface for some because there are great blessings. There are both sides of that. Even if you look at where it's positioned in Scripture, it's important. It's between Psalm 22 and Psalm 24. Duh, right? That's an easy one. But look, Psalm 22 is all about the Christ of Christ. The Christ of Christ. There you go. Write that one down and Facebook that one. The cross of Christ. The Christ of Christ. At least I caught it. Sometimes I don't catch it, and I listen to it later, and I was like, what was I saying? So Psalm 22 is all about the cross of Christ. Psalm 24 is all about the church. It's all about the kingdom, all about God's kingdom. And so between the, the cross of Christ and the bride of Christ, the kingdom, God's church, we have this beautiful psalm where God is the shepherd. God is the host. And we find many blessings in that. Many words of encouragement have been spoken over this psalm. Listen, it's a helpful message for us in many ways. First and foremost, because look, guys, the Lord is our shepherd. Okay, Psalm 23. Let's read those first four verses together. Starting in verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. How amazing it is to see the word Lord and shepherd in such close proximity to one another. It's really beautiful. David is really asserting that that the creator of the entire universe has taken on this mundane task, this menial task of shepherding. And David knows how important a shepherd is. He knows that sheep tend to they tend to wander. They need to be herded. Obviously, that's why there are shepherds. He knows that they go astray. And we do the same thing. We have those moments. Isaiah 53, 6, in fact, says, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And Matthew 9, 35 and 36 says this, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When, they saw, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. The Lord is our shepherd. He is. And we can't read those words without going back to John chapter 10, verse 11, when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Indeed, he is the good shepherd. He is the good shepherd who died for us. He's the great shepherd who has risen for us. He's the chief shepherd who's coming back for us. 1 Peter 5 4 says this, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. See, through Christ's redeeming work on the cross, he purchased his sheep. We were bought at a price, and it was his blood that bought us. And as his sheep, he now shepherds us, 
He guides us. He cares for us. He protects us as it's outlined here in Psalm 23. So, so know this morning when you leave here, the Lord is our shepherd. And because the Lord is our shepherd, we shall not want. Let's read verses 5 and 6 together. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I, I shall not want. God is enough. Amen? Yeah, God is enough. It's not just I shall not want. I'm not just saying I do not want. I'm saying I will not want. I don't have any need. He's my shepherd, and because of that, I don't want anything. He provides absolutely everything I need. If you look at how, how the rest of the text begins to unfold at this point, it's very clear. He leads us, right? He makes us to lie down in green pastures, and he leads us beside still waters. Just for a moment, even if you have to close your eyes, just for a moment, try to picture this, this beautiful green field, this green pasture, Green grass as far as the eye can see. I know it's tough to, to picture that in Arizona. It's usually the green weeds that we see. But try to picture green grass, okay? Just try to get that image in your head. Now imagine you're laying down in that nice cool grass. It feels really amazing. There's just a little bit. The sunlight is coming down on you. It's not hot. It's just warm. It's warm in you, but there's a gentle breeze that's blowing along. And off in the distance, very, very nearby, you hear just the slightest trickle of water. Yeah, it's, it's still waters, yes, but there's just a little bit of water flowing down over some rocks. Just to give you that indication, there's a water source nearby. It's not a raging rapid. It's not a waterfall, but it's there. That's what God wants. He's trying to say, listen, I want you to have this state of mind. I want you to understand what I want for you. This is what I want. I want you to be in this place where there's peacefulness. It's calm. It's safe, or he protects us. He provides for us. I mean, just think about that green pasture. That, that, that green grass was food for the sheep. That's what they would eat. They would eat the, the grass as food. They would drink from the water for nourishment. God wants the same thing for us, except that our green pasture is his word. He wants us feeding on his word. Man doesn't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from mouth of God. Yeah. He wants us in his word, studying his word, living his word, be his word, as we talked about last week. He, he wants that. And then that living water is his son, Jesus Christ. He wants us to have that vibrant relationship with his son. So he makes us in this way. He makes us to lie down in green pastures, and he leads us beside the still waters, and he restores our soul. You know, sheep tend to stray. We talked about this a long time ago, uh, many, many, many months back where we talked about the sheep. And, and sheep look right here. They, that's where they look. They look right in front of them. And they eat the grass. And ooh, so there's some more grass. You know, ooh, piece of candy. Ooh, piece of candy. And they keep moving. They just keep going right in front of them. And they see the grass. They're not listening to the shepherd's voice. And suddenly, they're out of earshot. And they can't hear the shepherd. Shepherd's got to go back. Shepherd's got to pick them up. Got to bring him back into the sheepfold, set him down. And he walks over and then he does his task again. And maybe he leans and kind of stares a little bit and watches the crowd. And inevitably there's another sheep who's looking down and ends up wandering again because he's not listening to the shepherd. He's not focused on the shepherd. And the same thing happens with us, guys. We do exactly the same thing. We don't focus on the voice of our shepherd, Jesus. We don't do that all the time and we end up straying. We end up wandering. David's going to know this very, very well in his near future with the murder of Uriah, the adultery with Bathsheba. There's going to be some things David is going to come across and it's going gonna, it's gonna to paint that picture where he's, he's stepping like this and he's just kind of scooting just a little bit, just scooting away from God. He's straying. We do exactly the same thing. But let me tell you, there was nothing, nothing at all that David could do that would take him outside of God's grace. Nothing. And there's nothing you can do either. There's nothing that you can do that's so horrible, that's so bad, that's so vile, that God's grace can't cover that. He's always waiting. He's patient. He doesn't want any to perish. He wants all to come into that saving relationship 
with his son, Jesus Christ. He restores our soul. And he leads us in paths of righteousness. You know, I love this. We, we don't lack direction. You know, as guys, we don't want to ask direction, right? No, we'll figure it out. Ten more miles, I think we can get, we'll just turn left. Right? We do that. Guys, yeah, guys are laughing and, and women are, are doing this. And I see elbows flying. It's like a Krav Maga class out there. You guys are, oh, yeah, listen to what he's saying. But we don't. We don't ask for directions. Just, I don't know if it's a guy thing necessarily. Uh, I, maybe it's a stubborn thing. I don't know. But, but we don't have to ask. I, I'm sorry. I, I've met with many people who say, I'm just so, I'm so confused. And I, I don't know what God wants. I don't know what direction God wants me to go. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't know where to turn. I just, I feel like there's just a lack of direction. I'm, I'm just not seeing it. But you know, he leads his people. He does. The Bible says, draw near to God and he will draw near to us, right? Lean not on your own understanding, right? But trust in the Lord. In fact, acknowledge him in all your ways and he will direct your paths. See, we, we, we don't lack direction too much. Too much. Um, Peter Jeffrey says this, our problem is not really one of guidance. It's one of closeness to God. And that's so true. When we walk closely with God, he leads us. He guides us. He leads us in those paths of righteousness, that is, paths that are in complete agreement with what his word teaches. He leads us. We don't have to be confused. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to sit down and say, I'm not really sure what God wants. Now, now some of those times those come up, and I understand. But I'm saying at a deeper level, you don't really even need to think about it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Everything else is in the bag. God's got it under control. If we just trust him, I know you love him. I know you believe in him. But if you would just trust him, you'd be amazed at the things that he would do in your life because he leads us in those paths of righteousness. And I love the next little line here. For his name's sake. It's all for his glory. Everything he does. Every path he leads us in, every single direction, everything. We start, we start zigging and he wants us to zag, right? And we get confused and wonder and we just kind of roll with it. And then we, we look back and we can see, right, hindsight. We can see it and we say, oh, God was just taking me away from that and bringing me to here. It's just so perfect. He leads us all for the glory of him, for his glory, because he receives the glory even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now, this is one of my favorite verses in this entire text, okay, in this entire passage, because I think it's a verse we say a lot in hospital rooms. I think we, we hear it a lot at funerals. And yet some would argue and say, well, it talks about walking through the valley of the shadow of death, and so it doesn't fit. But I want you to know something really amazing about this verse, okay? It's not the valley of the darkness of death, it's not the valley of the blackout of death. It's the valley of the shadow of death. Now, now here's the important thing to remember, okay? To have a shadow, there has to be a light source. You ever think about that? There has to be a light source to have a shadow. That light source is Jesus. He's the light of the world. He's walking with us. He's right there. He's leading us. He's guiding us. And because he is that source of light, there are shadows. But there are only shadows. There's no darkness. There's no blackouts. There's no confusion. He's right there leading us, guiding us at all times. So now, those are the first four verses. Now the table's set, our heads anointed, and the cup is overflowing. You know, culturally, for David, that was something that was just expected. Someone came to visit, you were a host, and as a host, you would anoint their head with some sort of an oil or a perfume, and you would give them a cup filled with the best wine that you had, the, the choicest, whatever wines are. I don't know what those things are called. I don't drink wine. But the, but the best, right? Vintage. I think that was the word I was looking for. Yeah, some of you are like, uh-huh, you're smiling, you know. Okay, you give them the best, right? You don't just, that, that's a way of saying, look, I, I have everything and everything that I have, I'm sharing with you. I'm not holding anything back. You know, it's like John Hammond would say, spared no expense. 
You know, you, you had a guest come over. You spared no expense. You gave them. And, and what David is saying here is this. God is so much more than any host could ever be. Because he doesn't just have a cup that's full. His cup is overflowing. It's so much more than anything or anyone could ever provide in this world. God far exceeds that. And David knows what he's talking about. He's writing this psalm at a time when, when scholars debate at exactly what was going on in his life. But I can tell you this. He was writing it at a time when he was focusing on God and God's goodness. That we know for sure. Because he just sits down and he starts writing, boy, God, you're awesome. You're my shepherd. He knew what that meant. He knew what it meant to be a shepherd. Now he's the sheep. He says, look, my cup, it's, it's overflowing. It's not just full. It's, it's running over. He knew again what that meant. The imagery that he uses, it's so beautiful. And it, and it gets to the point where it just leads him to finish the, the entire text by saying, I know without a shadow of a doubt that goodness and mercy, they're going to follow me every day of my life, and I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What a beautiful ending, a beautiful beginning. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, and because of that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk with him. He's going to walk with me. Goodness and mercy are going to follow me, and I'm going to dwell in his house forever and ever and ever. Guys, David knew what it meant to be a shepherd. He understood very, very clearly. He knew what that meant. Now he's a sheep. And he's relating that. God is his shepherd. It's a big deal. It's something that, again, it, because this passage is so familiar, I think we just kind of skip right over it and skip through it. But listen, as you walk out of here today, it should, I hope, it should be ingrained in your hearts and in your minds that he is your shepherd. The Lord is our shepherd. And because of that, we shall not want. That is the real beauty of Psalm 23 for you and for me. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for...